I want to I want to record this. So, anyhow, again, um, we're just going to talk here a little bit this morning, and 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 hopefully bring some words of encouragement to you. Um, I'm just going to ask for a blessing on you, the listener here to this morning. Um, and I have a few things here in mind that I feel the Lord wants to uh, bring to your hearing and to your ears. And uh, hopefully uh, I can help bring some understanding for you and uh, some blessing in your life this morning. So, dear, dear God, we just ask you this morning that you would move in a mighty way, God, to the hearing of the listeners. God, that you would open up the hearts, the minds, God. And, Lord, we just pray that your word would not return void. And God, we know it will not, Lord, because your word will be the same word that judges us in the last day. And God, you said not one one jot or tittle of your word will not pass or will, will not pass before uh, all. So heaven and earth, you said, would pass and things would cease to be. But your word, God, would stand against the the, the time and whatever beyond that, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, this morning. And we're just going to ask you to bless and open up our hearts and our understanding and that you would bless those that are hearing this morning and their lives. And God, you know those special needs in their life. God, you know their heart, you know their mind, you know the, the, the things they're dealing with, the people. And we just ask you, God, that you would open understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. If there were a title this morning to what we'd like to talk about, it's where are you at? Um, and you just see on the screen some, some various uh, things there. Um, but where are you at is, is what we want to talk about. Where are you today? Where are you in relation to where God wants you to be? Is your life meaningful? Are the things that you're doing accomplishing, are they targeted? Or are you just being tossed around by life's uh, troubles and, 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 and waves of, of, of just chaos? The Bible said God is not the author of a confusion. Now that does not mean, and a lot of people get this wrong, that does not mean that you're not going to have troubles because the Bible said that the, the many are, are, the, are the problems of a righteous man. So many are the trials. Many are troubles. There are many troubles, okay? Uh, troubles, what's that mean? That means hurdles, uh, challenges, okay? Uh, it's going to be many challenges. Not, you're, you're, you're given the armor of God for a reason. There is, it's talked about for a reason because you're going to go through some battles, all right? So let's, let's start out uh, this morning with... Uh, Reading Psalms 137, we're going to read 1 through 4. And it says, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us myrrh saying, Sing us one of those songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Amen. So let's kind of break this down. It was the children of Israel. They were the called people of God. They had seen God move. They've seen him work. They've seen miracles of God. And here they sat. Here they sat in Babylon. What was Babylon? What, what was the significance of Babylon? Babylon was their enemy. Babylon was their, their, their stronghold. Babylon was a, a, a king, a country that, that served after multiple gods. They had no one god. They had multiple gods. They served statues and, and idols and, and served themselves. So when we look at, they were by the rivers of Babylon. And there we sat down and we wept. Where are you at this morning? Are you sitting by the rivers of Babylon? Are you weeping inside? Are you longing for something better? 
something that you you believe exists out there that's that's not happened yet in your life are you in a place are you are you trying to say god i used to be close to you and, and for the backslider i used to be close to you i used to do this i was i was there i know what feeling your spirit feels like i know god where i'm supposed to be and 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 you 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 just have that longing inside there's just nothing nothing out there in babylon there's nothing where you're at satisfying that need that that hunger that desire to be right with your creator i'm having all these problems Sometimes God will allow things to enter our life, be it tragedy, whatever. It's not him moving it into your life, but him pulling back to reach you because of your own choices, your own decisions, your own ways that you have, have went. The path you have chosen brings you in sin. It brings you in bondage. And, and the children of Israel, had they listened to God, not strayed from him. They would not be in this situation today. In his first, in his text, we talk about here in Psalms 137. And then verse 2 said, We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. It's fascinating to me that they held onto that harp. And I would say to some backsliders today that you, you probably have an old tambourine in your closet somewhere. Just thinking one day, one day. I'm going to play that again before the Lord. It may be an old Bible that you've marked up with a highlighter. And you just kind of tucked away because there's just one day I'm going to come back to God. One day I'm going to feel something again. One day I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing those things that I've been led away with. One day I'll be free from Babylon. And I'm going to come back and I'll pick that old Bible up again and I'll look through those highlighted verses that, that meant so much to me, that changed me and gave me a new life and gave me something beyond, beyond where I've been led away to. And we go on to verse 3. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. You see, you have talents that God gave you that the world wants to use. That's why you have so many singers out there that, that have come from an apostolic Pentecostal church that God has given them vocals like an angel and given them such a great voice and, and such great talent from drummers, rock and roll drummers to to saxophone players in the jazz and and all these things they were given those talents to glorify god their creator and somewhere along the line the world said bring them over here we'll use them so the fact that they even had their harps with them is somewhat stunning to me. But I understand that. Because I held some of those things that I'll call relics when I backslid. I used to carry, and I carried for years, preaching tapes. And back then there were tapes, cassette tapes. And I know our generation today probably has no clue what those are. But you can still find it on the, on the internet. But I held on to some of those because I knew that they would, no one else probably had those. And eventually I lost them. But you see, we get off, we follow, we, we put those things back, those willows, uh, the, the harps we hang on the willows, we put in our, our, our storage and chest and, and, and our keepsake area. And somehow, 
we think that that's where it's at. And really, it's just a, a faded memory of what we used to be, what we used to do for God. Those things are gone. There's no power in those tapes anymore. There's no power in those pictures. There's no power in that tambourine. Because you see, the power was never in the, in the harps. It was never in the instruments. The power was in the person who wielded those devices. The power was in God's creation, the one that went back when you had given your all to God. In verse 4, it said, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And I know I'm talking to some backsliders this morning. I know that some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. I went through it myself. There's always been that hope in the back of your mind that someday, someday I'm going to be a Samson again. Someday I'm going to get that final lick of power that's going to propel me into that life that I once knew that I loved and, and that brought so much joy, inner joy and peace to my heart, my soul. But today it hasn't come yet. And these scriptures do not only speak to the backslider. I will tell you this morning, there are people at this moment right here and now sitting in church pews just got done worshiping the Lord. Just got done praising Jesus. They are working. They are feeling that they are doing what they need to do. They are going through emotions. But emotions will never get it. Emotions are just emotions. And if you need something more than emotions, it's called commitment. It's called repentance. And there are saints today that are starving, sitting in that church house pew, hearing some of the greatest vocals, the greatest musicians play and having some of the greatest sound systems and sound boards in the church and, and the acoustics are all just right so that they can enjoy and it's almost an entertainment factor They're competing with the world if you will and I get that I don't totally condemn that I, I, I know we, we, we want to entice people to come to our assemblies to hear the word of God. I think it's a good thing if it's done correctly, if it's maintained correctly, if it's maintained in the way God intended it. But we get to a competition with the world to where it's in the music, it's in the tambourine, it's in the instruments. It's no longer the commitment of the heart. It's no longer the burden of the soul. And we've fallen into those, those traps of selfishness. It's not about God anymore. It's not about the message anymore. It's not about the word of salvation. It's not about the gospel. We've moved from the gospel. The good news. But today is the day for you saints of God sitting there starving wondering what's next in your life going through the motions 
being in the school fish. There was something there for you. And I am talking about people, saints. And when I say saints, that means that you have went and repented. You've obeyed the scripture, the plan of salvation. You have went and repented of all your sins. You obeyed the scripture of being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You went down in a baptismal tank, a water, body of water, totally immersed in the name of Jesus. Not of title, not of any other thing, because there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Amen, if that's pronounced right. Whatever you do, the Bible said in Colossians, do all, whether it's word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. So the plan of salvation, repentance, godly sorrow. Thank God I'm wrong and my heart is broken and I need a change in my life. God, I, I don't want to continue in my way, God, but I need your way, God. I want life eternal. And Lord God, I just ask you to forgive me, Lord. And those, my friend, are words and commitments from the heart. The only thing God's going to receive. And then you obey the scripture of being baptized in the name of Jesus. And if you need examples, read through the Bible in Acts. Because that's the actions of the apostles. That's the obedience of what Jesus told the disciples to move forward with. That's the plan. And then he said he will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you say, well, I, I got the Holy Ghost, but how would I get the Holy Ghost? You get the Holy Ghost by reading and understanding what John chapter 3, 1 through 5, when Jesus told Nicodemus how he must be born again. And Jesus said it's of the water and of the Spirit. Amen. You gotta be born of the water and of the spirit. Notwithstanding, everybody knows that you have to come and, 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 and repent. But there is a process of being born of the water. And you find that process opened up and commanded when Jesus gave Peter the authority. keys to the kingdom. And Jesus was talking to Nicodemus alone. And Nicodemus said, Lord, what, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he can't even see the kingdom of God. He turned around and said it again. He said he can't even enter the kingdom of God. And he said, how do I know? He said, I, but I go back into my mother's womb. And, and, and Jesus said, no. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. I'm talking about the spirit. You have to have a new spirit. My spirit needs to be in you to help guide you into all truth and righteousness. And when you begin to say that, you begin to explain to him and expound how will I know? He said the spirit's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. But you hear the sound thereof. And in the fact that he said and compared this to a natural birth, when a baby's born, the waiting sound that a mother's waiting for when that baby comes out is a cry. And when that baby begins to cry, there's a relief that the baby is going to be all right. That first breath of life. And as that baby begins to cry out, it is words uttered. It is sound uttered that is not understood. But well understood. That it's a sign of life. Jesus compared that. And when you go back to Joel 2 and 28, where Peter on Acts 2 and 38, 37, began to say, it's as Joel said, this is that which was speaker, spoken 
by the prophet Joel that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Isaiah said that you will speak with new tongues. And Jesus said you'll hear a sound. He said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You're going to hear that sound. And the Bible said in Acts chapter 2 that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one mind and one accord, and they sat, and each of them sat, and they were filled with the gift of the power of the Holy Ghost. And it sat up on each of them, and they began to speak with cloven tongues like as a fire, and filled all the house where they were sitting. And as Jesus, as, as, as Peter was preaching on the day of, on Acts 2 and 38, about the day of Pentecost, and, and how all these people began to speak, in other languages, and, Jesus, and, and, and Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is that. And as he began to prophesy and tell them how they needed to be saved, and they began to say they were pricked in their heart, and the Bible said they, they were troubled in their spirit, and they, they didn't know what to do. Peter pronounced death because they needed to be converted for salvation. They begin to ask and said, brother, men and brother, what shall we do? And Peter, standing up, the Bible said, with the eleven, and said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he began to say what Joel said, the promises unto you and your children, even to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And as we read this, this, these scriptures in John 3, 1 through 5, about Jesus telling how you would be saved and how you would know that you're going to have, be born of the water and of the Spirit. And when we move down to John 3, 16, the, the most uh, quoted scripture in the religious world today, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. The Bible tells us also that, that, that we believe that this same author that began to tell us in the first part of this chapter how to be saved. You can't jump down to John 3, 16 and just say a few words and be saved. That's not going to work, my friend. There are works. It's not works of salvation. It's works of obedience to the Word of God. Because Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he's what? He's God, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him or obey his commandments and don't give up. And he said in John 8 and 24, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. you got to know that he is God. Amen. So let me let me let me continue on. So the current saints of God in, in the pews today, it's not good enough to go to church, to show up two or three times a week. It's not good enough to be a choir member, to be a Sunday school teacher. It's not good enough. Those of you entering into the ministry or whether you're a pastor or who you are, it's not good enough to set idol in the kingdom of God. We are going to give an account of the fruits that we bear in our life by the information and the openings of, of of scripture and knowledge that we have in the kingdom. We must be about our father's business. We have to move forward. 
we have to serve others. And I want to talk to you if you don't know Jesus today. If you have never, if religion's not for me tonight, kind of person. If you, if you were one of those folks, then I, I commend you. But where are you at? If you're listening this morning to this live stream, if you're listening to the Word of God, if you're, you're wondering where do I place with all the things that are happening right now in this world, we we I just could just you just pull it up, Google wars, whatever you want to Google, hunger, famine, earthquakes. Afghanistan, 1,150 people dead in an earthquake. Sri Lanka. Economy of the country has collapsed. People will be dying of hunger, starvation, if aid is not moved in very quickly. There's an active war from Russia to Ukraine. These things must be in the forefront of your mind. And I know there are people that just don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. No, I don't want to hear it. Shut the news off. I'm tired of listening to negative. Some may be negative, but it's reality. If there's an E5 tornado bearing down on your home, I would hope you have sense. to Go to your basement or cellar or seek some type of a Safety, especially if you're responsible for others, like a wife and kids, girlfriend, whatever, mother you're taking care of. This is urgent. Jesus said, when they, the disciples, Lord, when, when is this all going to happen? When, when, when is this going to happen? When is your coming? When is your kingdom going to be set up? When is the destruction you're talking about going to happen? Jesus says, just like you, you know, when the, when, the, when the fruit, when the blossoms begin to come on the trees, you know summer's nigh. It's nearing, it's coming. He said, when you hear roars of rumors of wars and, and, and famine and pestilences, corruption, and people say, hey, here, I'm Jesus. Follow me. Here. This is this is this is the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. When all these things, all the deceiving going on today, the hypocritical things happening today, leadership has failed from government to churches today. They're not telling you the truth. There's this, we're up here. And you are the lowlies down here. They want to separate themselves from you. This has happened from the beginning of time. Man has always tried to dictate and rule another. Well, people go to college, you, you, a lot of it's money, and you have a better life and stuff, but, but there's power. There's authority over others when you when you reach into those things. You begin to say, hey, you know, if I, if I am better at this, then the boss is going to make me boss, and I'll be telling them what to do. Look at the things that, that are, are current today. That's, that's our society. But as a sinner... As someone that may not know God today and have, have not tasted or experienced that gift of the Holy Ghost, you've not been through the process of repentance in Jesus' name and, and baptism in Jesus' name and getting filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance, that transforming, that entering in of God's Spirit into your body supernaturally, and you feeling the power of God that you've never felt in your life. 
and you begin to walk in obedience to the Bible, you begin to read the scripture, you begin to apply them in your life, you will see God come alive every day of your life. You will see him work. He will reveal things to you. I've seen so many things, so many revelations of, of what God's doing in my life and what, where he's brought me from and, and how he's brought me back from. God will begin to deal with you. He, it, it's, it's the calling in that process. He'll begin to open your eyes and your understanding. You're entering into... It's like the labor of a child. He'll begin to reveal things to you. You'll begin to start seeing new things. It's one of the greatest experiences you could ever have in this life. And God begins to open things up to you and begins to speak to your Creator, filling that emptiness, that void in your heart. Jesus talked about deceivers. We've got to we've got to talk a little bit about that today. And let me tell you, do not, do not, do not stop the process of salvation for your soul by saying, "Oh, they're hypocrites." Let me tell you something. You must hear the word of God. If you're hearing it preached this morning, act on it. This is the way you come to God. He said, by the foolishness of preaching, he chose to save. We are in the word of God. We are we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about the plan of salvation. Here we're quoting Acts 2.38, we're quoting John 3.16, we're quoting John 1 through 5. We're talking about Jesus here today. We're not talking about a man, we're not talking about how you need to join and be a member. But we're talking about a transformation in your life. To become a child of God, a son of God. Someone who has victory in your life. No matter what storms rage around you, no matter what predicament or situation you're in today, God can bring you peace in all that. And I'm not telling you some candy story that you're going to be just lifted out of. Those of you, if you're in prison right now and you, you ex turn your life over to God, at this moment your heart goes out to Him and you repent. You set up a baptism in Jesus' name and, and, and you get filled with the Holy Ghost. They're not getting out of prison right now. I'm not preaching that this morning. I'm not telling you everything's going to change in your life. But I am telling you that you're going to change in your life. Your perspective will be different. Your outlook will be different. You will have peace in your heart. You will have peace. You will have understanding. Your mind will become sober. greatest thing that you could have today is knowledge and understanding that you and your creator are on the same page. And that no matter what comes your way, good or bad, he's with you. And again, I just want to talk to you a little bit here. And I'm going to close here with the reading of the is Northern Apostolic Ministries. This is posted out there. Uh, if you've already read this, and everything's cool, whatever. Um, you need to go. It's been on here for about 30 minutes, I believe. But let me just read this to you, and you can go out and read it later if you have to go. Thank you for joining. Thank you for spending your time listening to the Word of God listening to, 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 the, to the things that will help you. Don't hang your sense in it up. If you have, remember Zion. 
You don't have to stay there in captivity. You don't have to stay there. Jesus said, I am spirit. My words are spirit. They are life. And I've come to save that which was lost. Today is the day of salvation. If any man hear my voice, and he harden not his heart, as in the day of provocation, but come, the Spirit says come, the church says come, and taste of the water of life for you. You, sir, you man, you friend, family, you can have a change today. You can leave this streaming, this video, this Facebook today. Find your place with God. Cry out to Him. Man, I remember I did that. I needed a job. I was in Muncie. I needed a job. I had no idea. I put in some applications and it even went up to Goshen and, and, and that night I prayed before God. I cried out to God. I said, God, I've got two children that I need to take care of. And man, he gave me a whole lot more. I got a call that next Monday morning with a job offer in Goshen, Indiana. And I was never more excited at that point in my life than to know God heard my prayer. Did everything change? No, no, no. Everything changed. Some things changed right away. One thing was my hope. I was able to know now that I got a job. <laughs> Found a place to stay. And, and bless Roy and Susie for that. And God has blessed them. And I, I thank them to this day. They open up their home for us to stay there. And, and God, along the way, we, we were coming up in, a, in an old borrowed Jeep. And we got to Cherubusco. It was winter. We were freezing. We had covers. There was no heat in that vehicle. And, and, and it broke down in Cherubusco. About 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. The light, the battery was dead. And it was a stop right there in the town. Thank God it was in the town, not on the highway, not in the middle of nowhere. But, but God was moving. And these, these were the steps. And I, and I told you earlier that God begins when he draws you and starts trying doing something for your life. You will see him through that process. And there we were in Cherubusco, sitting on the side of the road right downtown Cherubusco. And here comes a local Cherubusco street pastor. And I'm going to make this real quick here. He, he helped us get, he, he, the, the church was right there up the road. He had keys to the church. The Methodist Church, he, he let us come in there and get warm. Uh, I had a battery charge. I took the battery. He helped me get the battery to the church. I was able to charge the, the battery for about an hour or so. And after that, I was able to get it back in the vehicle and, and get on up to Goshen. And, you know, God moved in that. That took us to a church. Sometimes it just kind of nudges you in life and says, hey, Hello, I'm still in control. And if we don't go through bad times, many times we forget about it. It's human nature. Because we seem to want to call out when we have a need. Kind of like you and your parents, your children. When things are good, it's okay. But man, when things hit the fan, we start looking around for some help. But God is faithful and just to be there for us. Anyhow, I'm just going to read this real quick. And, and if you have any questions on this, I want you to reach out to me. Um, but it was called the Buck Stops here. And again, I say if you have to go, thank you for joining. And I appreciate your time. And, and we'll pray for all those that are, that are joined today or listened in the future. So the Buck Stops here. Great statement of the Apostle Paul in which we will interpret to mean that as long as we're following the word of God, as true disciples, and the gospel of Jesus, like Paul, as it was once preached and delivered, and you have no worries. 
And he said, do you fly away from me even as I also am of Christ? That's 1 Corinthians 11 and 9. Uh, but I just want to note here, I know this, it, 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 Paul was smart enough. Paul was reverent enough to the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, when he was writing, penning these letters, to know that, hey, I don't want Paul, I don't want me saying things in stead of the Holy Ghost. And if it's something I want to insert in there that I'm not feeling directed by the Holy Ghost directly to say as God gives it to me, I will let you know. And he did in many cases. So it just lets us know that Paul was a realist. He knew where he stood and he knew where God stood. And he was reverent to the Holy Ghost. You say, well, where did he say that? Well, he said many areas. Look in Corinthians. You'll see what this is I speaking and not the Lord. That's what he said. Look it up. Google it. I, not the Lord, Paul. Just Google that. You'll, you'll come to Corinthians. You'll see where. Read through there. <clears throat> so when people or men... Twist those things that Paul has talked about in setting up churches and offices and things like that. As Jesus said about the scribes and Pharisees placing burdens and commandments on people that they themselves feel privileged to not count their self in the mix. And I've heard it say, well, you, brother and sister, are not given the authority by God to correct me. This was actually said. And when you say that, that's hogwash from hell. Because that is nothing about Scripture. There's nothing God ever said. And if you're referring to the old law, you have a bigger problem. Because you're dragging the old law into grace. Are there things in the old law still in force? I would say yes but not anything that would directly conflict with Jesus and the spirit of truth. So anything that would conflict with that. So when you think that man is trying to overpower or be your authority in place of the Holy Ghost, which Jesus said, I will be in you, Jesus in you, the hope of glory, if they try to say, hey, you got to talk to me about this, you know, a good leader will tell you to pray about it and see what God says. And you know what? How do you know? God will confirm it, whether it's, he, he may not even confirm it with that leader at all. But he will confirm it, you will know, because you, not that leadership, will stand before God to give an account for your deeds done in your body. Do not rely on man for your route to heaven. The word that I speak, Jesus said, they are truth and they are life. You read your Bible and you go by that word because that is what's going to judge you. You will never be able to say, hey, pastor so-and-so or brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so or, you know, wow, he actually gives us examples in the Bible saying, Lord, we've done many wonderful works in your name. And Jesus said, I never knew you. How is that possible? Because you were deceived by man. And Jesus talked about deceit. Go out there on Google. Put deceive, deceiver, whatever, and, and, and KJV. That'll bring up Bible scripture. Deceiver, space, KJV. Search. Look at all the things. And look in the New Testament. Look what Jesus said about deceivers. Lo, many will come in my name. Don't proclaim to be a Christian. Hey, the first Christian church of Latter-day Saints, first Christian church of the Baptist, Pentecost, all these, all these things. They will come in my name. And he said, many will deceive you. That's kind of hard to fathom. Hey, when I, when I come to God, do I got to deal with all that? I got to worry about that? Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, 
That's why he said, let God be true and every man a liar. And what does he mean by that? Just what Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And the Bible said the Holy Ghost, when it's come, will speak of me, will testify of me. Not man, oh, so-and-so, pastor, leader, so-and-so, said to do this. I would warn you to not be calling anybody master. Quite similarity there, right, master, pastor? <laughs> but the point is, Jesus said, call no man master. But God. And we see God in the face of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about that, we have to know that it is God. You know, you've got the fivefold ministry. Many will, will twist the scriptures. And I say twist the scriptures because they slant them towards their own power and their own authority. They will they will they want to position themselves over you. I'm more consecrated to God. I'm closer to God, so I get to tell you what to do. Wow. The Bible said, know them by their fruits. And that Holy Ghost, when it comes, it's going to testify of Jesus, not man. Who are we supposed to lead people to? Jesus. Oh, you can come to our church, First uh, Pentecostal Church of uh, whatever. Uh, we got the truth. <laughs> Listen here. The truth may be preached there. There meaning it's not that significant. Uh, the word, Jesus, is what we should be bringing them to. The Bible said, John 1, 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We're no longer under the law, my friends. And, and, and if you think we are, you can ask Peter when, when, the, when the Spirit told him, when Jesus said, hey, there's a vision, you just reach out. And you, you, you touch these, grab these unclean things. The old law said, hey, you can't touch those things. You, you'll, be, you'll be bringing yourself to death. And Peter said, no, I'm not touching any unclean things. Three times. Only just three times with Peter. You know, he denied Christ three times. That's, that's why it was a reminder. You're not in charge, Peter. And Jesus said, this is a new, new living way that he brings. And I've heard it preached all I, it, it's You came to fulfill the law. And they try to bring that old law across the grace line. But that ain't what it meant. I came to fulfill the law. Jesus did fulfill the law. He stood there in the synagogue, in the temple, and he read Isaiah about. And he said, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears today. And he was talking about the coming of the Messiah, the Savior, the Master. And he said, this scripture is fulfilled. That's what he was fulfilling. When he went to the cross, that's what he was fulfilling. When he came back, and on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there was all one mind, one accord. That's when it all changed. That's when the new church started. That's when grace came by Jesus Christ. And the law was abolished. That's in your Bible. But we try to bring those things over to get advantage over others. And that is not of God. And I'm going to go a little bit right in. You, took, you go read the book of James. Respect to persons. God is not a respect to persons. So how do we, as men, start putting shelves up? Oh, you're up here. You're up here. He gave us an example. When you see a guy, a guy come in with good, good, uh, a good, nice suit, hey, you can sit up here. Hey, come 
sit on the platform there, preacher, deacon, elder. Oh, and then, then the, the guy that comes off the street, or, hey, maybe a saint from another church visiting because they have a night off. Uh, hey, yeah, hey, how you doing? You're not offering them the same? Well, I don't know how else you, you measure that, but that's respect to persons, and Jesus said, don't do it. James said, don't do it. And it's quoted, the fivefold ministry, you got some evangelists, teachers, preachers, pastors, prophets. The fivefold ministry is a help and a guide for the edification of the saints, the Bible says. Ephesians, right? Instruction and improvement is the definition of edification. So if the fivefold ministry is for instruction and improvement, it didn't say they're over you. It didn't say that they are your guide or your, your authority, total authority. It doesn't say that. Because if it did, it would conflict with what Jesus said, that you're all brethren. And it would conflict with what Paul said, you're all members of the body. So when he says you're all members of the same body, what does that mean? Not one's going to be over the other. Read your Bible. Read the scripture. What it says. So, when you go to a, a church or assembly or somebody, and it, it, you, you find those spirits in there, I'm not preaching against churches. I'm not preaching against pastors. There are great pastors. There are great leaderships in churches. They truly love you. They truly want what's right for you. They will give you the unfeigned word of God to guide you. And if they do insert anything, they'll say, hey, this is just my thought, not the Lord, not a commandment for you to do. And if you don't do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, have, have less favor of you. They're not trying to manipulate you in any way. Because Jesus said, accept your righteousness, shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Just like the scripture, if you're not born of the water and of the spirit, you can't enter in the kingdom of God. Wow. That is to the church. The other is to the sinner. You got the same warning. So when Jesus says, Matthew 23, 23, and 24, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. Who was the scribes and Pharisees of that day? They were the then-known leadership of church. Because Jesus went to their synagogues. Jesus taught in their synagogues. He read Isaiah in there, what we referenced earlier. So that was the law, the law of Moses. They sat in Moses' feet, the Bible says. Let's read it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. What's that mean? I'm going to tell you something I'm not going to do. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. So you're paying your tithes. You're doing what you're supposed to do in some of these things. But you don't do it in the, in the more important things like law, judgment, mercy, and faith. So you're not fair to people, you're partial, you have respect to persons, you tell others to do things that you won't do yourself. Let's go on. These ought ye have done. You're doing okay doing those, but you can't leave the other things undone. He called them blind guides. And that's exactly what a spiritual leader is, is a guide. They're not your master, they're not Jesus. Jesus said, you have one master, it's me. Don't call anybody else father or master. We want to get on some other religions like priests. Hey, I'm not going to go tell a priest what I did. No, but don't sit under the pastor that's telling you you can't do this or that, which is irrelevant to the word of God. You're falling under the same thing, and he's doing the same thing that the priest is doing. Get away from that. Address it. If they don't change, move on. Don't stay in that situation. You're responsible for your actions and what you do in the Lord. 
So as he come on, he said, you blind guides would strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. So just give you a quick, <laughs> I, I hate to even mention this because I do believe in it, but it's more about how you dress than where your heart is. You, you, can, you, can, you can do this in the church and you're okay to do that because you're under my guidance in it and, you know, I'm not going to correct you on that because, you know, it, it may kind of move you out of the church or whatever or, or, or you, you may quit paying your money or something to the church, but, man, don't do this, don't do that. And, and you're, you're, you're taking the little things. You can, people can have hatred in their heart serving on, on levels of the church That, that would mean you hate your brother. And if you hate your brother, how can you love me, Jesus said. And, and, and when we go back, we, we go to Revelation, my friends. We go to Revelation, and we, we start talking about chapter 2 of Revelation. Let me see. I got it here. Um, Jesus tells the church of Ephesus that he's aware of all their good works, their struggles, but there is strife. Even those who are vexing and the hypocrisy. But then turns the tables and said, But you have lost your first love, your first commandment, <coughs> excuse me, and demands repentance, or you'll be the one left in the field when the other's taken. Your candlestick, he said, will be removed. Your light in the window will go out. Lights out means you're gonna you're gonna suffer death. So Jesus essentially saying I don't know you at this point. You've lost your way. And I'm going to close with that. Thank you so much for listening today. I appreciate your time, your patience, uh, hearing the Word of God. If there's any questions, let me know. Reach out. And just thank you once again for being here.